then. He's, uh, he's uh, pretty much a blogger. He's also a trainer of schools and school heads. He has written a very fantastic book. If you haven't heard of it, um, it will be coming out very soon. He's a columnist on the Daily Graphic News. He's a father, and I've met one of his daughters, and he's now a grandfather, right? So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome Anis Hafer, a very good friend of mine, a very brilliant man, and to share his views on education and technology. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for the introduction. You have to perform. Pressure, pressure, and you're small. Meeting baby. Meeting baby, one saw me, you know, can say, I have a man. But anyway, it's really good to see all of you here. Uh, Jeff is right. Uh, the first time I met him, uh, he wanted to see me so badly, and I was wondering who this person was. And then he shows up, and I look at him. The guy is quite young, but he's very ambitious. Never say, hey, sorry, we, don't, we don't want any losers around us. So we've been together ever since, and you'll be surprised. I'm learning so much from him. G give the young man a hand. Give the young man a hand. I'm learning so much from him. And, uh, and his wife. Now, anytime I'm asked to speak on education, I take it personal. In the, <laughs> in the sense that, without it, where are we going to go? It's as simple as that. Without it, where are we going to go? At my age, I ask myself, what is it that I can do to help this country? It's as simple as that. And you realize that when you've been blessed with years of experience and practice, the least you can do is to bring to bear some of your own experiences so that others can learn from it. Now, and also, we all need mentors. So. Everybody needs a mentor. Do I hear amen on that one? Good. I have mentors. And I have a lot of them. But one of them is Quajil Agri. How many of you are familiar with the name? You, you don't know him. I don't know him either. We know of him. Yeah. Quajil Agri. He's the uh, one. You, we read about him. Uh, he's the one who uh, helped to set up Achimoto School with the governor of the day, uh, Gordon Gorgesberg. And I've developed what we call the Kweju Agri Principle. Let me repeat it. The Kweju Agri Principle. Something that he said in 1925. And what he says simply is this. Don't tell me what you know. Show me what you can do. Let, let me repeat this. This should be a mantra for each one of us in this room for our children, and for everybody that we see even in a leadership position. Don't tell me what you know. Show me what you can do. And that's what I call the Quajal Agri principle. Don't tell me what you know. Show me what you can do. And then we were lucky enough because the Osage of Kwame Nkrumah too came, and he too has what I call the Kwame Nkrumah principle. The point I'm trying to raise is this. Whatever it is that we do now, People have thought about them already. There's nothing under the sun that is new. And what Kwame Nkrumah says simply is this. We want thinkers. Thinkers of great thoughts. That's the first, that's his, what I call his preamble. We want thinkers. We want thinkers of great thoughts. That's the first part. And the second part, we want doers. Doers of great deeds. That's your surgery for you. If you don't have anything from him, that should be a preamble to our own lives in terms of what it is that we should focus our thinking on and also in terms of applications. Good. Now, having said that, then we come to technology, what uh, Jeff is so good at. But then before I say that, this is what I would like us to understand. Education has to serve a purpose. Many times we, th we talk about critical thinking. Have you heard it? It's all over the place. It's all over the place. Critical thinking. And the question is this. What on earth does critical thinking mean? Now, so I want to relate that to education because that's why we're here. How many teachers are in this room? Hey, hey, don't go like this. You raise your hand so we can see you. 
teaching is the noblest profession as far as I'm concerned. So where are the teachers again? Show by hand. Oh, uh -huh. Very good. Are there any parents in this room? Parents here. Mo kosi. Mamon sausin here homo. Very good. Are there any head teachers here? Fantastic. Let me tell you, the world revolves around us. Teachers, heads, and parents. What we do is very important, and what we don't do is equally important. But I'm addressing teachers now. Let's look at critical thinking. And we have to relate that to what education means from the beginning to the end. And then we want to look at Ghana, look at our situation. We've been independent since 1957. When Ghana became independent, I was in class three. I was in class three. In St. Peter's School, Kumasi. How many of you know where St. Peter's School is, Kumasi? Near the uh, Zongo, uh, Roman hill. I'm the whole minute, the same, the way you need to say, so you understand that's what we're talking about. And the issue is this what is it that we're going to do with our education? And then let's look at it and then ask ourselves has education been of help to us in a way where we could have accelerated our development? And all we have to do is to begin to look at our private schools in this country. Almost each one of them sits in dust. And there are no toilets there. No toilet papers. And it's a sad state of affairs. And I say this because I mean it. Okay? Now, we want to look at the environment. When we talk about critical thinking, the first place we want to look at is this. What is the environment in which I find myself situated? And then I will also go back to where I started class one. Like I said, 1957, I was in class three. But before I, became, I came to class three, I was somewhere else. I was in a little village in Obuasi called Tutuka. How many, how many of you know that one? Uh, hey, we have correct power with you. And how many of you know Kwa Brafoso? Aha, that's where the school was. Now check this. This was just one room. It was built by the Catholic Church. And then those days, your age didn't matter. If you go there, what you do is that you stretch your hands over your head. If it touches the tip of your ear, you qualify. But if you are short, you won't crank here because <laughs> as you begin to stretch your hand, you know, it's not reaching. Eh? And your mothers and grandmothers are trying to help you to reach it. She say, hey, or in a time or soon, or go for number next year. I have some partner make Then, you know, school wasn't just um, a privilege, you have to almost qualify for it. But I'll tell you what we did in class one. This is a brand new school, okay? And there were about 30 of us in class one. We were packed in one room, no toilet, nothing. But the first thing we did, I mean, I'm talking about critical thinking, and I want us to begin to look at the environment in which we are growing, and I want us to look at the environment in which we are growing our own children. Not some other children, no, our own children. So the first thing we did was that we used to wear six, seven, and eight in class one. Six, no, 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 because they were not grown enough. You have to be a bit muscular to be able to fit the, the, the physical demands of the environment. Usa, those in KG cranial. How many of you speak tree, by the way? Occasion, I'm a foul. You know what I mean? I'm a local boy. Okay. So what we did was that we go into the uh, bushes on Saturdays and Sundays and cut pampro. For those who don't know pampro, no, it's what? Bamboo. Uh -huh. So what we did is that we used a bamboo to wall our school in. The reason being that we're growing flowers. But when you grow flowers, there are particular animals that love the flowers as much as we do. The goats. They will come and eat the, the, uh, the <laughs> whatever we're growing. So we have to boil that, that in. Eventually, we grew hedges, we grew beautiful flowers, and we're in class one. That's how important the school was to us. It was a privilege to be in there because some people come in, they, they don't qualify and they have to go back. That's a pride that we had in our school. Can you imagine that we had continued with the same mentality from the 19 Kojo OO to now? This is, this is the environment. We want to talk about critical thinking. Are you with me? Yes. 
These are the factors that we have to have in mind. So as you begin to take your children to school, the first thing you want to ask yourself is this. What is the environment that I'm going to deposit my child in? And I'm assuming that you love your kids. Maybe what? So this, these are the things that we have to consider. The kid is going to be there from Anopa all the way to about three or four. What is the environment in which they're going to flourish? That is critical thinking. We don't need the definition for that. We have to see exactly what is going on. So, having said that, I want us to begin to look at the three key educational outcomes. If we don't do that, we are being hypocritical. The issue is this. From class one all the way to the university, what is the product that we can produce as a result of our education? That's number one. Don't tell me what you know. Show me what you can do. Great your agree principle. So the first thing, with all the education that we're getting, what is the product that we can produce? That's the first one. The second one, of all the education that we're getting, what is the service that I can provide for humanity to make the other person's life a bit easier? We need to understand that in this culture because we tend to be a little too selfish. We don't understand how to give of ourselves to make other people better. As a matter of fact, when we see that people are getting better, what do we want to do? PhD, pull him down. I've come to a point in my life where, frankly, I can't look at you and lie to you. We have to tell things like they are. So the second thing, of all the education that we're getting, what is the service that we can provide to the other person to make their life better than when we saw it? That is education. Before we go, cut it off for me. Women technicians, no, because I'm your me here. See if you can put it, cut it off. The code is 1947. Sorry about that. So, that's the second one. You see that digital generation? <laughs> we are in trouble, though. Small boys, no more here, no more here, no more here. Okay, the third one. Of all the education that you're getting, what is the solution to a particular societal problem where we will come to you for the action? So, what is it that we can do to solve a societal problem. These are the three key indicators. So whether we are in school or out of school, that is our responsibility. Those are the three key things. Now, today, thank God, technology is helping us. So it makes our lives easier. I'll give you this example. When I was in secondary school in Fanspin, and we had a teacher called Mr. Williamson. It's a white guy from England. He was telling us about silk worms and how silk worms make silk, which we use for clothing. When he was done, what he said was this. Now go to the library and find out more information about what it is that I'm trying to teach you. When we went to the library, guess what? We were lucky. There was one book that had information on silk worm. And in that book, there was only one page that had information on silkworm. And you know how many of us were 101 students with one book on one page? I'm telling where we've come from, where we are now, and where we can go. Now, some of my mates, they have sharp brains, huh? they will memorize the page, no problem, because that's what is expected to reproduce on paper. For people like me who couldn't memorize, and then we are in trouble. So I took a piece of paper and copied everything. But guess what? I lost it. I asked him. <laughs> so I had to go back to the book. The book was there. But when I opened the page, that page was dangling. After it's been handled by 101 students. Those were the days. Guess what we have now? I want us to see where we come from, where we are, and where we can go in the future. Today, press a button on the internet that your education hasn't even started. When you have a big degree, it's only a potential. If you have all ones or all A's, it's only a potential. You have two PhDs, that is still what? Maintain. That's still a potential. 
The issue is this. Let's go back to credulity rule. What is it that you can do with all these fantastic degrees that you have? Are you with me? I want us to place education in the right place so that we are not confused by it. Hmm? So the thing is this. You have 10 PhDs. I'm exaggerating now. What can you do with it? What is a product that you can produce with it? What is a service that you can provide for humanity to make another person's life easier? And the third one, we have a lot of social issues. What's your solution? Are you with me? So what I'm saying is this. We live in very critical times. And I'm talking from experience. I'm, I'm studying now more than I've ever done in my life. Because it's easier. And that's a challenge for everybody in this room. Is anyone here over 70 years? Give them a hand. Give them a hand. So that, that makes three of us. Oh, Mumu saw me home. So let, let, let's give them a hand. They've crossed, they've crossed the head of three scores and what? Ten. Let's give them a hand again. And still going strong. Okay? And if those of us in that bracket are steady now and hard, what excuses do the other people have? Expect the teachers, the parents, and the teachers, and more the teachers. They say, I've finished. Now I'm saying, you finished what? Say, this is my degree. <laughs> I say, I bet it now you don't even know what you're going to use it for. <laughs> the focus is how we can begin to add value to who we are. And it never stops. I cannot come here and stand here to talk to you unprepared. That to me, not taking you seriously. So you have to, we have to take each other seriously so that we are prepared sufficiently to begin to see how we can add value to ourselves and pass it on. So these are the big things that we need to do. Now, having said that, let's look at digital technology. Let's start from class one all the way to the professors. And what I'm saying is this. We live in a digital age, but our teachers are analog teachers. No, sir. We live in a digital age, but the people who are teaching us are analog teachers. So how are we going to cross the hurdle? So the responsibility, and the reason why I'm always enthused when I get invited by Jeff, because he's moving us to the next level with technology. We cannot be doing things the same old way because the same old way is hard. Are you with me? And then what I'll say is this. It's in our own selfish interest to make sure that we ourselves are digital and we are passing the message on to the people that we are teaching so that they too can become digital for our own selfish reasons. Because one day, we're going to need these people. Are you with me? We are not saying be digital for nothing. No. Good. And I'll give you a practical example. Technology is here to stay, and we all have to stay abreast with it. There has to be a movement. Now, I'll tell you a personal story. I got kidney stones. How many of you know what kidney stones are? I, I, I do. It's one, uh, for when a man gets it, they say it's like delivering a baby. That's the kind of pain that you get. I, had it, I don't know whether it was on the left or the right. Now, what had happened is that the tube between my kidney and the bladder was blocked by a kidney stone. So what had happened is that the kidney was enlarged and it was deformed because the urine cannot pass through the kidney to the bladder for it to be passed off. The pain, so I went to Kolebu. And the doctor said, look, what we have to do is to go through your penis, through your bladder, into your kidney to see whatever stone is there, hold it and pull it out. Now that is called an invasive procedure. What is the guarantee that it will work? So they have to cut you and do this sort of thing. That is analog. I've been so much here. 
That many be some part I just happened to have a sister who lived in another country. So I went there. And guess what? All they had to do was to lay me out on a table. And the doctor was right next to me. There was a screen between us. And with a computer, he could detect exactly where the stone was. And then he, what, do you, what do you do is that you use, uh, how do you call it? Um, laser. Who said laser? Uh, give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. Yeah, yeah me real crazy. <laughs> laser. So they'll use laser to pinpoint exactly where the stone was and then strike it. And you could hear it. For about 10, 20 minutes. And what that did is that it broke the stone. Now when I, and that's me free up I went home. And then you had to go to the bathroom and all the accumulation over the time that the kidney was blocked, it all came out. Strange colors. I mean strange stuff. Guess what? The, kid, uh, the stone was gone. Technology. Digital technology. So what I'm saying is this. It's in our own selfish interest to get out of that analog mindset and move on to something else. Because our very lives depend on it. Are you with me? So as we begin, so when, and whenever I interact with Jeff, he updates me. Because of the computer, Nancy Chairman, he understands the stuff better than I do. So what I'm saying is this. Don't be bashful. It doesn't matter how old you are. You either know it or you don't. If you don't know it, be humble enough to accept it. That's the number one. Don't be in denial. Accept it. That I, I'm not going to live the rest of my life with an analog mindset. So all of us have to now begin to be savvy in terms of how we can use digital technology. And then pass it on. So my last message to you is this. Never underestimate your children that you're teaching. Because these are the digital children. But you cannot teach them with an analog mindset. And then I'm going to point the last one out to you about our culture. That's very important. Our culture presupposes that if you're old like me, you know better than everybody else. Mais what? And then we have proverbs to support that mindset. You see what I'm saying? So support them. Encourage them. But then it becomes tricky. I'm talking from experience. So in terms of how I've raised my own children. We get very anxious about getting our kids to be involved in, let's say, smartphones, for example, because they can go to places where they're not supposed to go. Okay? So then, as parents and as teachers, what we have to do is to begin to educate them on the proper uses of any digital machine or equipment. Occasionally, okay, they will move on and do something else. But, sunny reality. But the important thing is that we want to raise them where they are now coming back to teach you. Again, that's the culture for you. And where are the parents in this room? Let's do it again. If you are not learning from your children, you are not teaching them anything. Where are the teachers in this room? If you are not learning from your students, something that you yourself don't know, you are not teaching them anything. That is why we have to now develop what we call a collegial attitude to the children that we are raising. And I'm emphasizing on this culture because there's a tendency to talk at them. You talk at them today. Or China also, you talk at them. Because they are tired of being talked at. So what do we need to do? We have to talk with them where we develop collegial attitudes. That my age is one thing. 
The way the world is moving, another thing. And you and I are going to cross that word together. So on that note, thank you very much. Huh? And uh, hopefully we'll meet again. Thank you very much, Anise. Um, 